Welcome back to your next lecture. This is Physics 235, Week 11, Day 3, scheduled for release on April 3rd, our last lecture of Week 11. Today's lecture will cover Chapter 16, most of it, but we're not going to cover it in gory mathematical detail. We're just going to talk about some big picture stuff. So this should be a relatively low-key lecture mathematically. Also note that quiz 10 does open today and is due by Monday at 10 a.m. unless you use a late pass. So let's get right into this. We're going to be talking about light for much of the rest of the course, and light kind of has two natures. Sometimes it acts like a wave and sometimes it acts like a particle. And this dual nature is referred to as the wave-particle duality. It will turn out that this wave-particle duality is also true of various subatomic particles like protons and electrons, but we're not going to get into that until uh, upper-level courses like quantum mechanics. For now, we're mostly going to be talking about light as a wave, and light is referred, for a very good reason, as an electromagnetic wave. And what this means is that there, there's both an electro or an electric field component to light, and there is also a magnetic or magnetic field component to light. And we can see these shown in this diagram over to the right. This light wave would be propagating kind of off the screen to the right. So if we clicked play on this still image, all of these wave fronts would continue to move in this general direction. But you can see that we have both an electric field and a magnetic field. So at any given point in space, let's say we want to talk about this point right here that I've labeled in green. At that point, there is a electric field pointing upward. And there is a magnetic field that points kind of back this direction. Note that this picture is supposed to show perspective, so the electric and magnetic fields will always be perpendicular to each other. This gives light one of its most interesting features in that light is the only wave that does not require a medium in order to travel. In a sense, the electric and magnetic fields will propagate through each other. And the way this works is actually related to some of the concepts we've already learned. So electromagnetic waves are often generated by accelerating charged particles or with an alternating current. And that alternating current creates a magnetic field that varies in time. And then that magnetic field that is varying in time then causes Faraday's law to come into effect, which causes an electric field a little further down the line. And that electric field varies in strength over time, and then that causes a magnetic field that varies over time, thus invoking Faraday's law again. So we kind of bootstrap ourselves up through this process where the time-varying magnetic field creates a time-varying electric field, which creates a time-varying magnetic field, and so on, and so on. I want to show you what this image looks like if it were to uh, actually be in motion, so you can get an idea what's actually happening here. So this is a good GIF I found of an electromagnetic wave traveling through space. You can see the electric field wave in blue and the magnetic field wave in red. You can see the electric field oscillates along the y-axis and the magnetic field oscillates along the z-axis. So the two vectors, electric and magnetic field, are always perpendicular to each other at any given point in space and at any given point in time. And here the direction of propagation is in the positive x-direction. So we can see that if we look at one particular point, so circling it with my mouse right here, if we focus on this point in space, we see the electric field at that location oscillates back and forth along the y-axis, and the magnetic field oscillates back and forth along the z-axis. So in order to figure out which direction the wave is propagating, we can use something called the pointing vector. Now, 
I haven't completely lost my senses or my ability to spell. I, pointing here is spelled with a Y because it's somebody's name. But the name is kind of fitting because the pointing vector points in the direction that the wave propagates. So if you take the cross product E cross B, you should get the direction that the electromagnetic wave actually propagates. So if we do this using our first right-hand rule, E cross B, we actually get that the propagation direction is actually this direction. So while this diagram may have been helpful for some things, like visualizing the electric and magnetic field, it turns out that it actually has the wrong direction for the propagation of light. E cross B, the direction of the pointing vector, tells us that this electromagnetic wave actually propagates down and to the left. We can actually give some formulas for our electric and magnetic fields here, and they are going to come back to our definition of various waves. So the electric field oscillates in the y direction, and that oscillation, the strength of the electric field at any given location and point in time, will depend on the location and the point in time and that is E naught, the maximum value of the electric field, times cosine of Kx minus omega t. So this is a traveling wave, like we saw way back at the beginning of the course. Similarly, the magnetic field oscillates in the z direction, and the strength of the magnetic field depends on what location we're talking about and what moment in time we're talking about. And follows the formula, the maximum value of the magnetic field B naught, times cosine of kx minus omega t. And it turns out that the maximum value of the electric field and the maximum value of the magnetic field are related to each other in the following way. If you take the maximum electric field and divide it by the maximum magnetic field, you get c, the speed of light, which has a value of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Further exemplifying the connection between electric effects and magnetic effects, you can also define the speed of light as 1 over the square root of mu naught times epsilon naught, our permeability and permittivity of free space. The last thing I want to talk about here on this slide is something called the intensity of an electromagnetic wave. And this is similar to the idea of intensity when we talked about sound waves back in the day. But this is going to be intensity of light waves, and this will bring the pointing vector back into our conversation. The intensity of a wave of light is going to be the average value of the pointing vector, which has a few formulas we could use. One of them is 1 over 2 times the speed of light times epsilon naught times the maximum value of the electric field squared but then we can use our relationship that E over B equals C to write this formula a couple different ways as well. So this could be also be written as C B naught squared over 2 mu naught, or it could be written as E naught B naught over 2 mu naught. And either of these will give you the intensity of the electromagnetic wave. We haven't gotten to this point yet, where we actually talk about the characteristics of light as a particle, but it's worth introducing something now. One is that a particle of light is generally called a photon. And another is that a photon does not have any mass, but it does still have momentum. If this seems weird to you because you know the formula of momentum equals mass times velocity, then you have every right to be confused. This is just the latest installment in the experience you'll get if you continue on in physics, where each successive class tells you, remember that thing you learned in the class last time? Well, it turns out that's not true. Well, it is true in certain circumstances. It's really an approximation. Here's the real story and then the next class will amend that, and the next class will amend that, and so on and so on and so on, and things just get more and more complicated. It turns out the formula for momentum equals mass times velocity is only really useful for 
everyday objects like birds, cars, boxes sliding down inclined planes. But when you get down to really, really small objects like photons and electrons, there's a more complicated formula that doesn't just depend on the mass. The demonstration that light has momentum, one of the common demonstrations, is this thing you see in the center of the screen called the Crookes radiometer. So you can see that we have a little metal ball here, and it is mostly evacuated of air, and we have these little paddle wheels on the inside. And one side of each paddle wheel is covered in a black material, and the other side of each paddle wheel is covered in a white or silvery reflective material. So, when you have light bounce off of something, since light does have momentum, it imparts some momentum to that object. So I want you to think about, should light impart more momentum when it's absorbed or when it's reflected? So think about that for a little bit. We're going to define something called P, which is unhelpfully not the momentum. It is called the radiation pressure. Where, as a reminder, pressure equals force divided by area. And the radiation pressure that light exerts on any object, well, depends what type of object it is and how well it absorbs or reflects light. The radiation pressure is equal to I, the intensity of the light, divided by C, the speed of light, if we are talking about a perfect absorber. And will be equal to 2I over C for a perfect reflector. So the answer to the question I told you all to think about is that light will impart more momentum when it reflects off of something than when it's absorbed by something. If you want a more classical example to compare this to, imagine somebody throws a baseball at your face. It takes less energy to stop the ball than it does to stop the ball and send it back the way that it came. So if the baseball just hits your face and crunches there, it's actually going to do less damage than if it bounced off of your face, or it will impart less momentum to you, rather. So if we shine light on this Crookes radiometer, think about what should happen. Well, if we think about the fins, and the silver fins are perfect reflectors, or close to perfect reflectors, and the black sides are perfect absorbers, then we should be imparting some momentum this direction from the reflector sides, and some momentum this direction. Momentum isn't a rotational vector, but its momentum will be imparted in such a way to make the pinwheel rotate in those directions. And we just want to think about which of these two effects is greater. And as we've just seen, more momentum is transferred when the object is reflective than when it's absorptive. So what should happen is that our pinwheel should rotate this direction. But it turns out that's not what actually happens in real life. Because it turns out that in real life, the Crookes radiometer rotates the opposite direction. So to explain why this is, we can start with what should happen. The radiometer should rotate away from you on the silver side and towards you on the dark side, because more momentum is imparted to the silver sides than to the dark sides. As far as what actually happens, this comes back to the idea that this little bubble here is not a perfect vacuum inside. There is still some air in there. So it turns out what actually happens in real life that kind of ruins this nice, amazing demonstration of the radiation pressure of light on absorbers and reflectors, what actually happens is that the black surface warms up, just like if you wear a black t-shirt out on a sunny day, it becomes much warmer than a white t-shirt. The black surface heats up, which causes it to accelerate some of the air molecules, heat up the air molecules near it, which causes those air molecules to bump more vigorously against the black sides, causing those sides to rotate away from you. 
So if we could get a Crooks radiometer that was truly a vacuum on the inside, it would act like what we had described in green. But it turns out they aren't all very well manufactured, so they do have some air inside of them, and what actually happens is what you see in purple. There are some other interesting applications of the radiation pressure exerted by light. One of them is something called a solar sail. Solar sails are a proposed mechanism of propulsion for satellites and spacecraft that sadly hasn't seen quite as widespread use as I'd like because I'm a big sci-fi nerd. Uh, but what you have with a solar sail is a similar idea to an actual sailboat, but rather than catching the wind and stealing the momentum from the motion of the air, you're stealing the momentum from light in order to power your spacecraft. So individual photons of light would come in and then bounce off of the solar sail. And that would impart a little bit of momentum to the solar sail in this direction. This P is actually momentum. So for every individual photon of light that bounces off the solar sail, the solar, whatever the solar sail is carrying moves a little bit faster. Another example of the radiation pressure of light is comets and their tails. You might not know this, but comets have two tails. One of them is called the plasma tail or the ion tail, and that's not really the one we're going to talk about. That one always points directly away from the sun and is caused by the solar wind, but that's not the one I really want to talk about. The tail of a comet that's relevant here is called the dust tail. A comet leaves a wake behind it of tiny little particles of dust that have been boiled off of its surface by the sun. And you can see those kind of shown right here in the light blue. Well, these tiny particles can then be struck by light from the sun. And when they're struck by light from the sun, they are pushed ever so outward, just a little bit. So they move to a slightly wider orbit. And you all have no reason to know this, but based on Kepler's laws, larger orbits are slower orbits. So the dust tail kind of lags behind the rest of the comet because as it's pushed out to a wider orbit, that's a slower orbit, so they kind of get pulled off to the side like that. But the dust tail of comets and solar sails are both good applications or examples of the radiation pressure of light in action in real life. The last thing I want to talk about today is something called the electromagnetic spectrum. And by talking about the electromagnetic spectrum, I want to expand your idea of what we mean when we say light. So everything on the electromagnetic spectrum on this entire image here is all electromagnetic radiation. The only difference is that it varies in frequency or it varies in wavelength. So if you take a wave of light that has a wavelength of 750 nanometers, that is just on the edge of the visible spectrum, which means we can see that light. But if you shift that to 760 nanometers, that's still light. Nothing else has changed except the wavelength and the frequency, but we now cannot detect that light with our eyeballs. That doesn't mean it's any less light. It's just light that we can't see. And there is a whole range of different wavelengths and frequencies of light that we call the electromagnetic spectrum. So there are a few trends I want you to be aware of on this graph. One of them is this one right here, increasing wavelength. So radio waves have the largest wavelengths and gamma rays have the shortest wavelengths. This also, this trend also applies within the visible spectrum. So red has longer wavelengths than purple. The other trend I want you to be aware of is uh, what happens with the energy and the frequency of the light. And that is the opposite trend. The left side of this graph has higher energy of light and higher frequency of light. So gamma rays and x-rays and ultraviolet K 
carry a lot more energy and have a lot higher frequencies than other kinds of light, and these are the ones that are more damaging to the human body. And on the far other side, radio waves have very low frequencies and very low amounts of total energy stored in them, so they aren't as damaging to the human body. I want to talk a little bit about each of these types of light that we can deal with here and some interesting features of each of them. So first, let's talk about radio waves. Radio waves are used for, among other things, transmitting radio signals. And these are the AM and FM signals that uh, you can tune into on your car's radio. And just as a note, AM stands for amplitude modulation, which means in order to contain data in this wave, they modulate the amplitude of the wave in order to encode the information in there. On the other hand, FM stands for frequency modulation, so they keep the amplitude the same, but they adjust the frequency over time to include whatever information they need to. There are better pictures of these in your book. I'm doing my best. Another example of radio waves is the high voltage power lines that we talked about when we talked about transformers. Often electromagnetic radiation of any kind is generated by accelerating charges back and forth. And high frequency power lines, or high voltage power lines, are carrying AC current, so those charges are moving back and forth and back and forth. And at such voltages, at such currents, at such frequencies, what's generated are extremely low frequency radio waves. The next region of the electromagnetic spectrum as we move up towards higher frequencies are microwaves. The most obvious use of microwaves is, well, in microwaves, the things you use to heat up your food. And microwaves are used to heat food because certain frequencies of microwaves will impart energy to water molecules. So when you turn your microwave on, there is some electromagnetic radiation generator in there that is creating these microwaves, and those microwaves form standing waves inside of your microwave, just like we saw with standing waves on a string way back at the beginning of the course. And one thing that we remember about standing waves is that they have nodes and antinodes. So wherever there is a node, that means the intensity of the microwaves is very small and those spots in your food remain cold. This is why microwaves have fans, to reflect the microwaves around the entire interior of the microwave and to just circulate the air, and why the microwave table at the bottom rotates is to try to spread out the cold spots so they don't stay in one spot in your food the entire time. Other examples of microwaves include Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, RFID tags, and radar, especially satellite communications. The next section of the electromagnetic spectrum is infrared, sometimes just called IR. And most of the radiation from the sun that arrives at the Earth is infrared radiation. But other objects also emit infrared radiation. This can be living objects, and even some structures will emit infrared radiation that you might refer to more colloquially as heat. So this is how thermal vision works. Thermal vision goggles are basically goggles that are programmed to be able to detect infrared light. So you can see the body heat or ambient heat being given off from living bodies or buildings or structures or things like that. The next portion of the electromagnetic spectrum is the visible portion, referred to as visible light, specifically because we can see it. We are not able to see any of the other forms of electromagnetic radiation, but we can see visible light. This is why we call it visible light, it's because it's the part we can see. The solar spectrum, all of the frequencies and wavelengths emitted by the sun 
peaks in this region. It's also useful to know that visible light is not absorbed by the atmosphere. Various portions, in fact most of the electromagnetic spectrum is absorbed at some point in the atmosphere, but visible light is not, which is good because it means we can see for long distances through the atmosphere. Next up is UV or ultraviolet, which is most notable for its ability to cause sunburns. In addition to causing sunburns, UV light causes certain materials to fluoresce. So fluorescent dyes are often added to important samples to track them in experiments, and fluorescence is also of a certain importance to various black light social events, where uh, your colors on your shirt will glow differently than you're used to, and your teeth will seem to fluoresce almost a kind of purplish color. Second to last here is x-rays, which are used for, perhaps not surprisingly, x-rays. Different parts of our body are more or less transparent to x-rays, so if we put our hand underneath an x-ray machine and record the portion of x-rays that travel through our hand, we will see lighter and darker spots depending on what the x-ray had to pass through in order to get to the film. And this is how we can get images of our bones. So x-rays are beneficial to be able to figure out if our bones are broken, but x-rays are also very dangerous. In general, the higher the frequency, the more dangerous the radiation is. So x-rays, in addition to being useful medically, can also cause cancer and genetic defects. Last but not least are gamma rays. Gamma rays are the most damaging radiation because they carry the most energy. Gamma rays are very similar to x-rays with a slightly higher frequency, and also they're produced in different ways. So gamma rays have similar dangers and uses as x-rays. So gamma rays can be used in nuclear medicine or cancer therapy. But all of this is light. If by light we mean an electromagnetic wave, also referred to as electromagnetic radiation, then all of these qualify. The only one we can see is visible light. Indeed, we probably evolved to be able to see these specific frequencies and wavelengths of light because they are not absorbed by the atmosphere and that the sun peaks so strongly in this range. With a different star, with a different solar spectrum, with a different atmosphere that absorbs different wavelengths of light, perhaps we would have evolved to see some different portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. But in all likelihood, we would have called that portion the visible spectrum no matter where it was. So there's nothing particularly special about this 400 to 700 nanometer range of visible light, except that that is what our bodies have evolved to be able to detect with the rods and cones in our eyes. There are a couple of interesting stories I want to relay with the, uh, as far as infrared light goes. One is the discovery of infrared light I find interesting. A scientist asked themselves the question, which color of light is the hottest? So they set up a prison in their laboratory, a prism, not a prison, a prism in their laboratory and cast a rainbow onto their workbench. And they put thermometers down in each of the different colors. They put a thermometer in blue, a thermometer in green, a thermometer in yellow, a thermometer in orange, a thermometer in red. And all good science experiments have a control. So as a control, this scientist put a thermometer past the red where there was no more rainbow. And then when he came back in to check his results, he found that the control thermometer, the one that was past the red end of the rainbow, was actually the hottest thermometer. So he concluded that there was clearly still some energy carried even past the point where we could actually see the light, and that was the discovery of infrared light. Another example of infrared light that I didn't discuss earlier is TV remotes, or the Wii sensor bar, if you have that particular Nintendo system. For a TV remote, the TV will generate an infrared signal, so it will generate infrared electromagnetic radiation, and then there's a receiver somewhere on the front of your TV that can sense this information. 
The Wii sensor bar is a little bit different. The Wii sensor bar is like the remote in that all it does is emit infrared radiation that the Wiimote can then detect. So, one day, when our Wii sensor bar stopped working in college, we lit two candles and set them on top of our TV about the same distance apart as the Wii sensor bar, and we were able to play our game as normal. Because the Wii sensor bar doesn't do anything specific other than emit infrared radiation. So, candles and flame and heat also emit infrared radiation, so we are able to use candles as a stand-in for our Wii sensor bar here. The only other thing I want to talk about is just a couple of relevant formulas. One of them is kind of a throwback, because if you take the wavelength of any kind of wave times the frequency of that kind of wave, you get the speed of that wave, which is in this case the speed of light. We also want to know how much energy each of these particles of light or photons might carry. And as we saw before, the energy seems to increase with the frequency. And the formula, it turns out, is very much indicative of that. The energy of one photon, of one individual particle of light, is equal to h times the frequency, where h is a constant called Planck's constant, which has a value of 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. I also momentum mentioned that momentum is defined slightly differently for light, and I've kind of run out of room down here, so I'm going to put this at the top, where P, which is the momentum here, not the radiation pressure, and this is the momentum of one photon, is just going to be equal to the energy of that photon of light divided by the speed of light. Well, energy is just equal to Planck's constant times the frequency, and from our relationship defining the speed of any given wave, the frequency divided by the wave, or frequency divided by the speed of light is equal to 1 over the wavelength. So this could be written as h over lambda. So Planck's constant over the wavelength gives you the momentum of the light. So this was more of a conceptual lecture. I'll see if I can find some good homework problems from it. But I hope you enjoyed it, and I really enjoy talking about light as a wave and the electromagnetic spectrum. It's very interesting to me to think that all of this is the same type of thing. It's all an electromagnetic wave, and the only difference is the frequency and wavelength. These borders between the different regions that you see are generally fairly fuzzy, so there will be some microwaves that overlap all the way to here, some radio waves that overlap all the way to here, and the border between x-rays and gamma rays is particularly fuzzy. You can read in your textbook for more details there, but this is the general idea. See if you can come up with a good mnemonic in order to remember the order of the electromagnetic spectrum, because I may ask you, hey, a microwave or an x-ray, which one has more energy, or a question like that. And the mnemonic I recommend here is the following. That gate X usually lets in most radiation. So this gives you the order of the spectrum from lowest wavelength to highest wavelength, or from highest energy to lowest energy. The G in gate stands for gamma, the X stands for X-rays, U stands for ultraviolet, L stands for light, or in this case visible light, I stands for infrared, M stands for microwave, and R stands for radio waves. That is everything I have for you guys today, so thank you for watching, and have a good weekend.